Hello and welcome to the first ever Electronic Aramite Reviews. I'm your host, the Electronic Aramite. Before we get to the review, I'd like to give a little bit of information about myself and the Electronic Aramite. I'm a... why electronic? Well, I'm a long-time gadget geek and PC gamer, a little bit of console game, also, of course, bo avid board gamer from way, way back. Why Aramite? Well, it is a medieval word for a religious hermit, and because, as a vocation, I am a medievalist, I wanted to choose something that sounded a little medieval, and somebody else already took the word Viking. So I chose Aramite. Uh, as a medievalist, I'm going to apologize to Tom Vassell because I actually do study medieval trade in the Mediterranean. Yeah, I know. Anyway, uh, about the review, some of the goals that are going to make my review maybe a little different from what's out here is I'm going to focus, as an Aramite, I'm a little bit of a hermit, and I'm going to focus on how games play not only with multiples, but also with particularly two players, and if applicable, solo play. Uh, today, we're not going to talk a little about solo play very much, as the game isn't uh, good for that, but I am going to talk about two players. So let's go ahead and get to the review. Today's review is going to be about Dungeon Pets, a new game by Vladel Chapville and published by Z-Man Games. So without further ado, let me uh, let you look at the pieces. All right, what you see here in front of you is the player action board. This is going to be put out in the middle. I sort of set it up like we were beginning a new game, although there would be a few more things. You'd have uh, some nice little minions. If you're familiar with Dungeon Lords, the minions here are uh, for keeping score or various other things. Um, you would have these put out in different places, some here, others here for keeping score. Uh, you'd also have, depending on if you're playing a one or two player game or a three or four player game, you would use a different side of this action board. You would flip it over and you would seed the board then uh, for a two, a one and a two and three player game. You would seed the board with neutral imps to block off actions. For those of you that have played Agricola, uh, you can think of this sort of like that middle board where you decide where you want to take actions. It's, as you can see, this one is a lot more detailed as far as the art is concerned. And at first look, you're a little bit confused as to what's an action and what might just be background art. You get over that, but at my initial feeling of the game was, whoa, that is one cluttered action board. Anyway, I've got a few things here. Over here, you would put some uh, vegetables in your vegetable stand. Those feed your vegetable eating pets. Over here, you've got a mixed food stand, which will have maybe vegetables and meat. And down here, you're going to have a meat stand. Now, the premise of the game is that you're a family of imps. And what you're trying to do is set up a pet store to sell pets to dungeon lords that might be coming and wanting new pets. Well, the pets that you're trying to sell, you can see a few of them here. Here's a nice interesting looking guy. If we can get that to zoom in, there we go. He's a carnivore. You can tell by the meat down here. He's young. This is actually their age down here. I'll explain that in a little bit later. Uh, the pets are trouble pets. They're not your typical cats, dogs, whatever. They are troublesome and they're hard to take care of. So the whole game basically is spent trying to make sure, mitigate some of the damage, mitigate some of the problems that pop up with these dungeon pets, and then eventually sell them or put them in an exhibition and make the most points by having the fewest amount of negatives. So. It's an interesting system. It's very much a risk-reward system as far as you want as many pets as you can get, but the more pets that you can get, the harder it is to take care of them. You want to take care of them as best you can, but sometimes things happen. In this game, sometimes poop happens, and you just can't do anything about it. So it's trying to find ways to get around the needs and wants of the pets 
Fulfill them as best you can and mitigate some of the damage when you can't fulfill them. I'm going to put this in the middle here. This is actually the individual player board. Don't know. Here we go. And it looks like a t-shirt because this game involves bidding. So during your bidding, you're going to fold that up like that. Now I know, I know bidding. Some of you are, right now are saying, oh my gosh, bidding, I'm turning this review off. I don't want to talk about it. I don't like bidding. Bidding's terrible. Well, I don't like bidding either. And uh, usually a bidding game doesn't work at all with two players, but this type of bidding does. And it's not at all obnoxious. So this is why I think the bidding in Dungeon Pets is actually quite good. You'll see you start with a family of six imps. And again, if you're a fan of Dungeon Lords, you'll be, uh, you'll be able to see these imps. You'll know them right off the bat. And you put them down here. And when you want to take an action, before this, the whole action phase, you bid by making groups. Now you also start with this stuff. It's gold. Nice wooden component here. Nice wooden chits. And you start with gold. You can make groups out of gold or imps. So for example, I'm going to pull this up a little bit. I might put two imps here and two gold. I might put two imps on this one here, one imp, and uh, one imp here, maybe an imp and a gold. There you go. So then what you would do is when all players have done that, you would show your groups, and the largest groups get to go first, and so on. So it could be that if I had, say, two groups of four, and gold counts for an imp, you always have to have at least one imp in a group, but uh, gold basically counts for an imp. And so that's how you sometimes can overcome your opponents when they have the same amount of imps. If you get a lot more gold than they do, then you can overpower them a little bit. At any rate, let's say you have two groups of four. Well, you might go twice in a row if everybody else only had groups of three. So you would take your group and then you would decide to put them in one of the action spaces on the board. So for example, let's, uh, let's put them right here. That means I can buy a pet. There's a whole lot else on the player board here. Uh, this very confusing looking thing actually tells you the distribution of the pet need cards, which is really helpful. You've got a, an iconographic breakdown of what happens each turn. That's really nice. It's iconographic. Once you learn the icons, you know exactly what's going on. Over here you have the icons of what happens to you when you fulfill or don't fulfill a need, uh, what the needs are and what they mean. Uh, again, once you learn the icons, really, really helpful. Takes a little bit of a learning curve to learn the icons, particularly if you're thinking about playing this as with casual gamers who might say, oh my gosh, what do all these symbols mean? Anyway, let's say uh, I put my group right there. Well, that means I get to take a pet. So uh, I'm going to take this fish guy here, Bubbles. Yeah, they all have names and... Uh, they all have a little bit of uh, funny backstories. Uh, having a little trouble. There we go. Bubbles. And I would go over and put it next to my other player board, which is this. Now you start, uh, this is where you keep your cages. You can have four cages. Uh, you start with one, and uh, each also has a place for an add-on, which makes your cages different. As you can see, the cages are rated. They have a red number, which means how much rage or how much... Uh, anger they can contain of a pet. They have a purple number, which is how much of the magic they can contain of a pet. So you're going to have different ones. You might then later get uh, this cage to put on your board. And this one, C, has zero rage, but it's really magical. So it's good for your magical pets. Whereas you might have this one, where it's three rage and zero magic. Or you might have ones that have special abilities. Like this one doesn't hold very much, but as you can see, it's got a little little grass, a little uh, leaf check, and a little poop check. That means it'll automatically fulfill a herbivore's eating needs and it will automatically absorb one uh, token of poop. Yes, this game has lots and lots of poop. Well, that's basically the rundown on your pets and your cages from the very basic standpoint. I don't want to go into every detail, obviously. Um, but I do want to look some more at the board here and I also want to talk about the pets and then what you finally do with them. 
So I know you notice that I put this down here. It's got a little smiley imp and what looks like a sunshine. Well, actually, that's a smiley imp and a gold, meaning that this space requires you at least have one imp and one gold to use it. So there are two types of spaces that require specialty things. Uh, this one is to get a cage over here, and it says two amps, so the cages are heavy, you have to have two amps. Otherwise, everything else takes pretty much one amp. Right here is their add-on space. When you uh, go here, you can pick an add-on, it takes one amp. Over here, you've got artifacts. These artifacts do different things. For example, uh, this one will allow you to have an extra card in your hand. Uh, so that you have more choices on when you assign needs, and I'll get to that. Uh, this one's kind of nice. It's a long-handled shovel. It lets you uh, clean up cages, to poop out of cages, while the, the pets are in their cage. Usually you can't do that. You've got a hospital over here. Your imps might get hurt uh, if they're trying to stop a pet from escaping. So you'll have to go and get them out of the hospital. You do have what's sort of called the, the imp immigration service. Uh, you'll get more, ch you'll get chances as the turn progress, turns progress to get more imps. And then this is an exhibition judging area. When you have an exhibition, you're going to compete for points in that exhibition, and the people who get the highest points are going to get eight points. People who get second highest, six, third highest, fourth, uh, second highest, second. This space will actually let you go free two spaces up so that it, it sort of cheats a little when the exhibition comes. So it's a neat way that if you know your opponent it's going to do better in a particular exhibition showing his pet, you can kind of game the system a little bit and hope to overcome him or her. Again, there's a lot more going on here I don't want to go into, but uh, let's talk about the pets. So, after all this, you're going to have your pet. And I'm going to put this board here, right in the middle there. Um, you're going to have a new cage, let's say, and you're going to assign your pet to a cage. Now you'll notice, these are cool actually, they're nice eggs on this side, so when you pull them out, you'll notice they actually rotate. So as they grow, they get more and more. And these little colored bars are the types of needs that these pets have. For example, here you have a purple need and a red need for bubbles. Purple is typically your magic needs. Red is typically anger. You've got green down here that's typically food and pooping. Um, he doesn't have it, but let me pull one that does. You have a yellow need for uh, playfulness. So sometimes they need to be played with. At any rate, when you get a pet, during your turn, you're going to have to fulfill its needs. So let me zoom in a little on bubbles here. There we go. So you've got purple and red. So you start with a hand of four cards. Let me pick up the cards here and show you. A hand of four cards. And during your turn, you're going to have to assign these cards to each pet. Of course, when you also have your turn, you're going to have to additionally draw the colors that are on the pet. So I would have these four, one of each color. can never have mo more than four uh, unless you've drawn for needs at the end of your turn anyway. You can never have more than four unless you've drawn for your needs you, or you have an artifact. So for bubbles then, I would have to draw another purple. Ooh, that's nice. That's a, that's a nasty rage there. And another red. Uh, that, that's something uh, normally red's rage, but this is playfulness. So then I would have to look at what I can do and say, well, okay, I can, uh, this, this cage can fulfill one rage need. It can also fulfill one eating need uh, for him because he's an herbivore, and it'll fulfill one poop need, but it can't do anything about magic. So I'd look at my, I have to then apply these cards to him exactly how he's there. So I need to give him a purple one and a red one. So here's my two purples. I've got a magic and a rage. Ooh, man, well, you know, he can't, that cage doesn't do anything for, for magic. So if I give him a magic, that means something bad's going to happen because I can't absorb it. So I, maybe I want to give him a rage. Okay, well, what other red cards do I have? Well, I've got a rage and a, uh, a yarn ball, a play. So I might have to give him, let's say, a rage and a yarn ball. And then we decide whether or not I can, I can fulfill those needs. Well, the rage is go ahead. He, he tries to hit the cage. He doesn't escape. That's great. Well, for playing, 
Uh, the only way I can fulfill a play need is hopefully I left an imp that didn't go out on the action board in reserve so that I can put him in this nice spot here to play with bubbles. The cool thing is that imps can play with actually two cages so when you put them in between a cage they play with both cages so if there's a pet over here that needs play uh, then you can uh, fulfill both needs. But let's say I didn't have that. Oh my goodness, I, you know, Bubbles wants to play. I totally neglected him. Oh man. Then he gets one of these. My wife and I have uh, thought about calling them the Smoky Cubes of Shame. But they're actually called Suffering Cubes. So I would put that Suffering Cube on him. That's going to be bad. Suffering pretty much always reduces their value, reduces the amount of points you're going to get. Let's say there are other, let's look at some other needs. You know, you've got your uh, poop need. Yeah, there you go. Nice little pile of poop. It's basically nothing you can do. Either you have a, uh, have a, a cage that will go ahead and take the poop away or you'll put a nice little, little poop, poop cube down there. You might have, uh, you might have a disease need. Poop isn't normally problematic. Sometimes it's bad for selling a pet or uh, sometimes it's bad for exhibitions. But it's actually worse with this little Mr. Yuck face here, this disease. If there's too much poop in the cage, then he'll get suffering cubes. If you don't feed him, he'll get suffering cubes. Uh, pretty much uh, if he goes over rage that the cage can handle, then, you, then he escapes and you have to assign either... Uh, imps that haven't been used to go go find him and then they go to the hospital because they got hurt or the pet escapes and you lose the pet completely. So uh, there's a lot going on here. It's kind of neat. It's a really neat mechanic where you get these different cards and then you assign them to your pet and that determines what's going on. It is however best looked at as a disaster mitigation game because you almost never can get everything running perfectly particularly if you have multiple pets you're gonna have you may be drawing six of these cards you may be assigning uh, you'll have to assign six if you draw six you may not have enough your cages you know you're looking to try to uh, maybe you you should have bought this add-on that added uh, an extra red number to your cage you didn't do it somebody blocked you you had a great strategy you couldn't get the food who knows something's gonna happen and you're probably gonna get suffering cubes you hope don't hopefully you don't lose uh, your pet if you get too much magic they actually mutate if you can't if you can't fulfill their magic two mutation counters and they pop off to another dimension so you lose the pet there let me pause for a second and I'm gonna pull forward the exhibition uh, board so that you can see the different exhibitions and how you actually score and win the game and we're back so here's the exhibition board and you'll notice that for a three or four player game the game only goes to about five rounds and then there's a scoring round uh, you'll be marking this with a little purple little purple turn thing this little symbol just means you change who the first player is the first player marker is it's actually really hilarious this little, little circle that you put a little uh, monster face on it it's kinda neat anyway I haven't put all the exhibitions. This right here is an exhibition. This is sort of a variety show exhibition. And it's got a lot of symbols on it. So at first you're like, what in the world does this mean? It's actually pretty easy. What this means is that you choose one pet. This down here just tells you how many uh, types of food you're going to put every turn. So whenever the turn goes forward, for example, when it hits here, you're going to put uh, three vegetables, one and one in the, in the mixed one, and two meats. At any rate... Uh, the, the area up here shows you the positive points you're going to get and the area down here shows things that are going to subtract from your score. So let me pull Bubbles up here and uh, let's see. Let's say Bubbles has gotten a little older. Yeah, okay. Bubbles has gotten a little older. And it only counts the cards you've assigned for each turn. So this exhibition is going to look at the cards you just assigned him. And for this one, you get a point for every different color you've given him. So the max you can uh, get is five. You can do the four colors, and then there's a potion card that actually counts. And so let's say uh, you know Bubbles got a, he got a, he's going to get. Well, you're going to definitely get if you can, if you can do it. And he doesn't escape. He's going to have at least two reds, 
one green and one purple, so that's that's three points. That's nice, three points. But let's say he has uh, poop in his cage. Oops, well, then you lost a point there. So now you've only got two points. The little nasty, smiley, nasty uh, frowny face is suffering. Well, he had a suffering, so then he lost a point there. So now you've only got one point. Hopefully he didn't mutate. Then he got zero points. He wouldn't even be able to be in the exhibition. So like I said, uh, it only counts what you have assigned him right then. So it's kind of neat. I mean, you have to look forward. You can always see the next exhibition in line. And you can always see the next uh, few people who are going to buy pets, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, you're always going to see those. So you kind of have to think, what am I going to play this turn? And what am I going to play during the turn of the exhibition? Because again, you can keep four cards in your hand between each turn. So you can, you can plan ahead a little bit. And that's actually where the entire game is, is trying to figure out how to maximize the exhibitions and then throw off on things you know you can't do. Here's another exhibition. This is the eating contest. You, you get two points for every uh, food need that you've applied, uh, but you lose for every disease that you had to apply. So again, and uh, those are, you don't get points exactly, so four points doesn't give you four points on the track. Four points gives you four exhibition points, which then you have to see who got the best in the exhibition, and that'll uh, equal victory points. It's an easy calculation. The other way you can get victory points and a little bit of money is by selling your pets. Here's, uh, here's your little dungeon lord. He's actually the dungeon lord. You have the dungeon mistress here. She's kind of cute. She's a dragon there in a the dress. Uh, you have all sorts of different ones. There's uh, several. Um, at any rate, he might come to buy your pet. So what he likes, he really loves magic. So, you know, he loves magic here. And he also likes playfulness. I mean, he doesn't want him too awful. Uh, but he doesn't like mutations, and all of them hate suffering. So what you're going to do for him is you might want to try to sell. Now, everybody gets to a chance to sell to the person coming. He'll buy as many uh, pets as there are players, so there's no worry about somebody blocking you from selling. Uh, you can alter the multiplier you're going to get with an action on the board. Uh, that's, again, something for the rules. But anyway, uh, so you, you might have a problem where, well, you've got an exhibition that needs one of everything, and then he wants magic and uh, yarn. He wants magic and playfulness. Now, that wouldn't be too bad, because you might be able to do that and still have different colors. But let's say you had that eating contest. Well, that's, boy, that's not going to help. I mean, the eating isn't going to help sell him. So you've got to make a choice. You can make far more points by selling, though. Of course, when you sell, you lose the pet. Sometimes it's great because when you have a real problematic pet, let's say Bubbles gotten really nice and, and older here. He's gotten super problematic. I don't have any food to feed him for next round. I got to get rid of him. I can unload him. Uh, how much gold you'll get is down here. Um, and you'll get points depending on what it is. For example, if you had assigned him uh, two magics, that would be four points plus uh, one. Maybe you, you gave him one playfulness, there's five points. And you either do it on a multiple of times two, so either times, so that would be ten points, or times three, fifteen points. So your selling is a good way to, once you've raised the pet to a certain level, you want to get rid of him, you want to dump him. Uh, you, you can't handle them anymore. You get a little influx of gold. Gold is really only used for that bidding part. You, you don't really need it other than you at least have to have one gold to buy a pet. But gold comes in every turn. So it's not like something where you, you buy enhancements or anything. It all has to do with that action board. all has to do with your groups. Anyway, you can unload a pet, get a whole bunch of points. The points will change dramatically very quickly, particularly when you're selling. Like I said, with just two magics and one playfulness, that's five. It's always a multiplier of times two. You're at least going to get ten points. Uh, of course, if you lose some for these, you're not going to get as many, but you're at least going to get ten points. If you manage to think ahead and use the auction block to sell them, again, that's an action, you're going to get fifteen points. That is huge. You're suddenly going to jump up in points. So we found the game to be highly dynamic as well as far as the points, is uh, the points are concerned. You're, you're going to change really quick. You're going to jump really quick. I think that's great, actually, because even the person that's a little bit behind sells a couple pets, boom, you are suddenly in the lead. Uh, you can only really usually sell one pet per turn. At the very end, you're going to have two salesmen. You can sell one to each. So let me clean this up, and then I'm going to tell you what I thought. So what do I think? Well, uh, 
First, let's talk about sort of the incidental things first, like component quality, uh, manual quality. All that's wonderful. I mean, the components are to be expected from both a, a Vlottle game and a, a game by Z-Man, or at least as I found it, uh, the components are very, very good. The little plastic imps are awesome. The minions have stickers, that, and they're actually differentiated. There's one that's bug-eyed, one that looks old. Completely useless to the game to have that, but it's nice anyway. The pets are hilarious looking. They're really cute. They're, they're nice. The egg, the egg mechanism where they look like an egg and it turns is a really neat and unique mechanism. I like that. I like that a lot. The boards are beautiful. I did say, and I still stick by it, I know some people disagree, but the board is too busy. The action board is just too busy. It's nice. I know. I know people like that because it adds some flavor to the game. But when you're trying to teach it, or when you're trying to learn it yourself, those action spaces just sort of disappear in a mass of imps playing dungeon lords and imps fighting and imps here and imps there and, and somebody doing something on there. It's, it's, I know, I know. It's really neat. Once I learned the game a lot and I've played it and played it and played it and played it, I think all that's just going to disappear, which then again you have to ask yourself, well, why is it all there if you're just going dis to disappear in your mind anyway? Yeah, I know, I know. I would rather have it be nicely decorated than just a stark white and black board with action spaces. Um, so in that case, like, for example, dominant species, you know, it's not, it's not utilitarian, but then again, this is a complex game. So having a little bit more utilitarian is, is something. I know people will disagree with me on that, but I think it's a bit too busy. The player boards are really nice. I don't think there's a, there's a problem. The art on that's nice. That's what you stare at a lot of the time when you're making your groups. So anyway, artwork and components, fantastic. The manual is all color. It's really nice. It's short enough to be easy to read, it's long enough to be come, uh, to give all sort of contingencies you're going to run across. We didn't have very many questions when we played that we had to grab the manual. It's not like that. Uh, we did have to grab the manual quite a bit for how to set up between turns. That's where things get a little complicated. You have to move some things here, discard some other things, put new things out. So I think having a player aid would be really nice to say, here's what you do in between turns. So I think I'm going to actually try to make a player aid so that it's easier for me. I don't have to flip through the manual. And the, the reason is, too, that two-player games and three-player games, uh, the, the in-between turn bookkeeping is different than three and four. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, two-player, three-player is different than a four-player game. I'm sorry. Um... So it would be nice to have a player a for both of those, you know, maybe a dual-sided player anyway. Now, how about the game? Well, I like it. I do like it. I like it. I like it quite a bit actually. There's a lot of strategy going on. The one thing I will say, it's very cutesy art. It is a game that has a lot of theme, and that's something cool. You don't see a game with unique theme. I mean, yeah, oh, hey, it's a game about a pet shop run by imps. And not just a normal pet shop, but a pet shop for dungeon pets, for monstrous pets, uh, a Cthulhu, a, fur, a little furry Cthulhu, a, uh, a spider thing, a fairy that's made out of flames. Really neat stuff. So theme, it just oozes theme. And it, and it, and it feels like you're doing that, too. I mean, yes, okay, deep down, it's, it's just a, a assign cards to a certain spot type of game. But you, you feel like you are actually caring for your pet, which I think is cool. It's a really neat theme and the execution is, is nice. And, you know, you get into it. Oh, you didn't have enough rage, or oh, he mutated because of magic, or boy, your, your cages are just full of poop. I mean, any game where you're throwing around poop cubes uh, it's got to be kind of have a few extra points for that, right? So I really do like the game. I like it quite a bit. Now, as I said, complex game. It is a cutesy game. You might not be able to think about that in the same in the same sentence, but you're going to look at this and say, oh, it's about pets and pet keeping, and maybe kids would like it. Oh my gosh. And maybe kids if, if they're hardcore gaming kids. But it, it is a Vlottle game. 
It is a Vladl game. It is not, I've been told, as complex as Dungeon Lords. I've never played Dungeon Lords. So I've heard that it is more casual friendly than Dungeon Lords. I'm only looking at it from my perspective and my wife's perspective. She is much more of a casual gamer than I am. She likes Agricola eh, about La Havre. She's not really into it. Um, she likes some more simple games. She does like games like this where there's a competition. There is no direct, it is multiplayer solitaire in a sense. There's no direct way you can affect your other, uh, your opponents, which I guess is nice. I mean, you don't want to sabotage them. There's already enough going on. You don't need to worry about your, your opponents sabotaging you. At any rate, it is not, it is a complicated game. It is not purely casual, even though the theme is a bit cutesy. It definitely is highly strategic. You have to plan ahead. If you don't plan ahead, you're either not going to get very many points or you're going to lose a pet. So you really have to plan ahead. Too much suffering, they die. Too much, uh, not enough able, ability to keep in their rage, they escape. Too much magic, they mutate and, and disappear. And you lose points when that happens. So like I said, plan ahead. It is a complicated game. And I like complicated games, so I don't find this, it wasn't particularly complicated for me, per se, because I love things like Twilight Imperium, and I love the deep, you know, like Descent and things like this. That's, that's stuff I like. Uh, for my wife, it, it's hard. She looks at me and says, this is kind of hard. And I said, yeah. And I had to coach her for the first game or so to, to say, well, why don't you, you know, do this and do that for a learning game. It is a little more casual friendly than some I've played, but I think it is, it still is very highly a, a somewhat of an economic, more of a planning ahead type game. Some caveats as to some things I'm just sort of feeling. Like I said, I really do like the game, but I'm kind of wondering, I, after we played, I was thinking, I said, well, did, did my actions really affect the outcome? And yeah, they did. I mean, you have to plan ahead with the, the cards that you play. And you have to plan ahead by getting the right food. So the actions that you take uh, to mitigate the damage that you can have happen to you, all that, yes, that has a huge impact. But did it have an impact as far as the exhibitions and the selling is concerned? Well, sort of. Because you do draw those need cards randomly. So you might be planning ahead a little bit, but you aren't going to be able to fully plan ahead until you get all your need cards. And if you just don't draw the right need cards, well, you can't do anything about the exhibition. I mean, if you need magic and you didn't draw any magic and you didn't have it in your hand to begin with, well, that that's, keeps you out of the exhibition. Now, I'm going to change that here. There is a, an advanced rule set. And the advanced rule set, the cards that are in your need piles, the ones that are the main card for that, so for example, green, it is eating, purple, it is magic, they're just a one type of card, it'll have just magic on it. The other ones, where it might be a purple card with rage on it, which is normally the red, they will have a dual symbol, sometimes rage magic, sometimes... and. This is where you can decide in the advanced rule set if you want to play it solely as the rage or flip it over if you can take it and do a rage magic. That is going to mitigate the random factor. That is going to make the game twice as strategic because you will have cards that you can use either as one thing or as two things, meaning you still, it makes it more difficult to fulfill your needs, but you can control the exhibitions a bit more and the sales. So yeah. We didn't play the advanced yet because the game is complicated enough. We're working on it. Now, I said I was going to talk about two players. Like I said, no ability to solo play this one. Uh, not even, you know, jury rigging it a little bit. I mean, it's a, it's a complete... What you could do, I guess, is solo play it like Agricola, where you just sort of play to get your the highest points. But, again, you know, you got to find a way to block off things. So, really, that's not even workable. Now, two-player fantastic. It's a fantastic two-player game. I don't think that there will be any sort of difference for most people between two, three, four. Really not at all. Uh, there's going to be a little bit in the sense that you will see more randomness. You don't know exactly what your opponents are going to do, but the way the board works is that for a two- and three-player game, you seed them with neutral imps and they move in a, a circuit 
taking up actions, removing options for you. So you can predict where they're going to go. But in my mind, for a two-player game, that makes it more strategic. You know you have to get vegetables this round because next round, there's not going to be any vegetables. So in a sense, adding those neutral imps that are moving around adds more strategy has less randomness because, I mean, unless you can just read minds and know what a human opponent's going to do every single time, then, you know, there's going to be not randomness, but there's going to be trying to react to a human. For a two-player game, that's kind of neat. It adds that additional element of strategy where you know where the imps are going to go. Some people will say, well, I don't like that. I want to fight against people, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. If you've got a lot of friends and you want to, you know, play, that's great. Right now, I'm playing two-player mostly here. Uh, I do think my gaming group will enjoy the game. They are more along the lines of the Descent kind of Ameritrash, roll the die, hit the monster kind of thing. Uh, this game is not that, so it'll take them some time to get used to that idea. The other caveat I have, uh, so yes, two-player game's good. The, the other caveat I have is, <laughs> it's kind of a personal one. My wife really loves animals, so I got this game thinking, all right, a game where you raise animals, it's really cool. They're cute animals. She likes, she likes dungeons and fantasies and stuff like that too. But, we played the first learning game. And she looks over at me, we didn't finish it because it was late at night, so we just wanted to learn. She looks over at me and she goes, I don't like hurting animals. And I thought, there really is very few ways that you can get through the game without at least something bad happening to one of your animals. So again, it's a, it's a personal caveat, but if you can't take your plans falling through, or if you don't like the idea of putting suffering cubes on, on an animal, if that bothers you, or if it's just simply the strategy where you know, you've planned ahead, you really think you're going to do well, and then suddenly, oops, something went wrong, or oh no, you suddenly didn't draw any, uh, you were hoping you would draw, you know, green is mostly food, you were really hoping to draw food, but suddenly you drew a rage, oh my gosh, you didn't even leave an imp behind, your pet escapes, ruins your plans, you know, ruins three turns of, a, of it growing and, and you planning to sell it next turn. If you can't take that sort of thing, where your plans can fall apart, uh, depending upon uh, a draw of a card, then the game is going to be hard to stomach for you. And if, if, again, if it's just a personal thing, you don't like hurting animals, or you don't like the idea that they're suffering, yeah, again, you might have a little bit of a problem with that theme. Anyway, I've taken up too much time here, and I really hope you enjoyed the very first Electronic Air might review. I hope to be doing more of these in the near future. Please feel free to leave me any sort of commentary. Uh, like I said, this is the maiden voyage, so uh, any commentary is helpful. Of course, I always appreciate uh, well-wishing and thumbs. Thumbs are good. And I would love to see you again in my next review coming up. Thanks a lot.